Okay, th uh, thanks everyone for uh, doing a wonderful job. Uh, I'm going to follow the protocol that Stacy followed in the previous one. I have a list of questions of my own. So if you don't mind, I would like to ask them first and then I'll open it up uh, for the audience as well. So I guess my first question is that, I, as I told you before, I'm dying to understand and I'm trying to understand uh, your take on it that yesterday we heard from Urs uh, at Google that they built one of the largest network which is open for an SDN enable. Uh, they have been using it now for uh, whatever. They had the first version a year ago and now they built the second version um, uh, three or four months ago. So how do you interpret that? What, what do you make of that in terms of uh, where we are, what it would mean for open flow and SDN going forward? So maybe we can start with Ons. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that's a great question. And uh, it was some of the best news I think I've heard in a long time, right? When, you, when you've got a company like Google that, that embraces the concept so whole, wholeheartedly, it sends a message of commitment to the industry that is very, very difficult to ignore. And to see them use it so successfully, right, and to talk about the growth of traffic they have east-west in their network, and the message that sends to other firms that are going to be following suit, right, and, and we have to prepare, prepare for those same types of challenges, it says that uh, we're going down the right path, right, that the solution is, is viable, that it has a huge opportunity for success. And it really, I think, legitimizes the, the ONF and, and really sends a message out there that you guys are here to stay. Alvin, you want to say something? Yeah, from my perspective, it's definitely a great proof point uh, that ONF can be made to work. Uh, however, I'll also um, add that in this particular case, you owned both sides of the network. It, um, it, it was slices across the network um, and uh, steering apps that you know well. These are proprietary apps that uh, you know and control. Plus, you have a smart set of folks that are able to program into this world. The question, uh, I think, uh, back to the earlier point made, is how do you take that knowledge, encapsulate it, and make it available to the rest of us when you're running on shared networks, when you're running on uh, off-the-shelf hardware, or at least uh, existing uh, um, uh, silicon, existing routing, existing networks, if you will. But I do. Uh, appreciate uh, that this, these are the kind of proof points that will um, gather steam and show the rest of the industry that A, it can be done, but B, it's needed to, done, it needed to be done, and C, it solves a real problem. So, so this is a really, I think, important step forward for the industry. You want to say something? Well, I think uh, two things. I mean, for, <clears throat> first of all, uh, as you probably know, most people in the industry have known this for a while. And as we were pushing, so I think it's great that it's finally public, as we were been pushing SDN over the last year or so, most people who have been pushing it know that there was a great proof point of Google using this. Um, you know, I, I, I agree with Alwyn in a sense of this is a great proof point. Uh, what we need to do is focus on how do we get this to be able to be used further, but that's a typical evolution of technology. You always start somewhere. And I think the fact that Google is doing that is, is really important because there are people out there saying, well, you know, this is a nice academic idea. Well, guess what? It's not an academic idea. People are using it in real world scenarios and it will evolve. The key for us is to evolve it so that it could be used by a wider set of people. Okay. John, you want to send Yeah, they're all smarter than me, but I, you know, I, from, from my perspective, it, it, big data is the same, right? Uh, uh, Hadoop something that emerged in academia and with the largest companies, Facebook, you know, Google, Twitter, LinkedIn. And um, you know, they had lots of engineers to throw at the problem while it's still raw. But the, you know, the idea that it actually can solve even these hard problems and over time evolves and matures is exactly what brings it to the mass market. So for Google to stand up and say, hey, it works for us, I think is a great step in the evolution. And so you know, I was excited. I think for startups out there, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. Okay. So then as a follow-up question, I want to understand the following uh, from your perspective. That is, a lot of times people are saying, oh, OpenFlow and SDN is on this hype curve, right? It's going up. So when you listen to all of this, how do you separate what do you think is the reality of where we are with OpenFlow and SDN and its potential and where we are versus the hype? So can you kind of uh, sh share your perspective on what you consider is reality and uh, what is the hype uh, and what we should be careful about? I, I would love to weigh in there, right? And uh, we're, 
we're very we're at the very early stages of what's happening, right? And I think we're really trying to sort of unwind that story. And, and what's great about the Google piece is that it starts to help unwind some of that mystique and starts to help us figure out where that's going to go. And I think the big challenge that we've got going forward to really legitimizing SDN as a whole is, is really building that operational package around it, right? Really putting the right tools, putting the right kind of services around it in order to be able to manage these big networks, right? And that's sort of the confidence booster, I think, that's going to grow it past the Google, right? So if we, if we build the right kind of tools and services around it so that you can send the message that you can have a highly resilient, very reliable network, I think that's really going to help punch that out and really start to set that differentiation up. Okay. Yeah, from, from my perspective, one of the really nice things that the SDN ONF team has done is start uh, creating a different worldview, if you will, of networking, uh, the notion of the SDN controller, northbound APIs, southbound APIs, the controller, the protocol. And I think one of the reasons that networking has succeeded so well over the last 20, 30 years is the notion of layering, abstractions, the ability for different parts of the stack to evolve differentially from uh, each other. So I think uh, some of the most important uh, points that need to solidify soon, things like the SDN APIs and northbound APIs, that will allow a whole bunch of customers, operators, uh, data center, um, uh, professionals, if you will, be able to bring up and orchestrate uh, their networking needs very quickly. In the meanwhile, much like VMware is doing, we're taking an evolutionary path in certain aspects uh, because the reality of the situation is most of the network is already in in most enterprises, and it'll take a while for that set of uh, networking hardware to uh, be replaced, uh, you know, maybe one rack at a time by open flow enabled switches. But it'll be a long while. I mean, we always tend to uh, underestimate how long it takes for a given technology uh, to make way for another technology. So the reality of the next few years is there's going to be all kinds of devices in the network. And that's why an evolutionary path and some of the middle layers and then the ability to replace it with open flow uh, enabled uh, either switches or virtual switches or controllers uh, is the way I see it evolving rather than getting forklift uh, upgraded. I think uh, <clears throat> we are a bit of a danger of the hype, but I think that's okay. Uh, if you look at the industry, <laughs> right, initially people start to talk about stuff, and then over time people think, oh, this is the best thing ever, and they start to try different things. And over time, as people start to do applications, some things work, and those applications become popular, and some things don't work, and they die off. And I think we're in the moment right now with a lot of experimentation and innovation, and that's actually great. It's good for networking. Uh, I think, you know, the, the thing that we need to look at closely is, you know, what are people using it and how are they being successful? I think Google is a good example. I think there are other applications where people are using it. And as those applications become more mature and as those uses become more mature, then we'll have, you know, real use cases that can become more generalized. Uh, right now, you know, you hear some people talking about, hey, you know, we're going to have an app store, you're going to download things automatically and all the applications are going to work and everything's going to be like the iPhone. It's possible. I mean, I don't think it's going to happen, but anything's possible, <laughs> uh, right? But you know, and then you have other people like Google saying, "No, we're just using it to, to build our system with our engineers." And so the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. But it's okay. During a period of innovation, you have lots of ideas, and some stick and some don't. I think we're in this phase, and it's a healthy phase. It's a good phase. So people just have to remember we're in that phase. Not everything will stick, but some things will really stick, and they will really evolve in ways that we can't predict right now. Yeah. The only thing I'll add is. Uh you know, as an investor, you, I'm very lucky and that I work with these, you know, world-class entrepreneurs, right? And we sit in these board meetings every six weeks and, you know, where we are right now, I can, I can tell that this, this line is between the architects and the operational people, right? So the architects love this concept. <laughs> the operational people are like the white blood cells sometimes that react to, and so, you know, it's just, it's a process. It's going to take time, but um, I think that's where, that's where the, the line is. So one more question. So I guess in uh, whatever in last uh, two days and even before, uh, when you think about SDN and virtualization, I keep hearing two things. This is all about. It appears sometimes that it is all about orchestration of data center VMs and orchestration of networking together. So I wonder, is SDN all about uh, this particular? Is that the killer app in terms of orchestration of VMs and networking together? 
or there are other applications as well. So maybe this time we can start with John Yu. I think the reality is physical and virtual, right? You've got to, you've got to have both. But I think the promise is like, if you don't believe in virtualization, then this probably isn't as interesting to you. And so um, you know, the killer applications, I think, are going to be more narrow than that. It, you know, maybe it's a particular kind of VM or a particular use case, business solution that you know, you're trying to solve for. Um, but I certainly think it's an integral part yeah, going forward. That orchestration of VMs and networking, and so you think that is what it is all about? I mean, we talk mostly? about yeah, we talk about cloud, which is just essentially an extension of you know high virtualization penetration. As is, there's three legs of the stool, right? There's compute, storage, and networking. Uh -huh. the compute and storage have been fairly aggressive in sort of embracing virtualization. Networking has been lagging behind. Mm -hmm. right? But when customers go and seek out the promise of cloud, you know, flexible resources on demand, you you need all three to work together. And so without it, I, I don't see how the, you know. And is it across, within the data center, within the enterprise network, within the service provider network? So you see virtualization across all these three types of networks, or is it just within the data center networks, for example? Well, today, I mean, I think in the service provider segment, Amazon's been kicking everyone's butt. And so the hosting companies are trying to figure out how they catch up. And the network is a big piece of that. And so they can either build it all themselves, but here Amazon's got a seven-year lead, or they can figure out how to work with the ecosystem. And then there are some cutting edge companies like a Fidelity that are figuring out, hey, they want to run private clouds. And so they, they got to get on the same, same train. Mm -hmm. But I think the urgency has been in the, in the service provider segment initially, segment initially because of Amazon's pressure on the industry as a whole. I think, there's, I think the, the initial app, probably because of the, some of the pressures around making the, what we call the fabric more flexible, is around network virtualization. So that's the current hot app. But I think we would be remiss if we thought that's the only where it's going to be applied. I think that's the hot app and a lot of because there's a big problem there. But if you look around and see what people are doing, there's a lot of people doing some very interesting things. And I think it's going to evolve. We're going to be using SDN a lot further than that. That's going to be used for SDN, and it will evolve into some specific use cases. But like I mentioned before, you know, people are doing some very interesting things with policy hmm. that we, they could do them before, but this is so much more elegant. Um, you know, they're making NAC work, if you know what I mean. Uh, and people are coming up with all kinds of other ideas of how you could do maybe higher layers, have better control of like layer four and higher services. So I think that the leading edge right now in terms of implementation is around network virtualization, but I actually believe you're gonna see a wide use of uh, SDN concepts across different parts of networking as people find new interesting uses for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah clearly, gonna... yeah, clearly data center, virtualization, and automation orchestration, these seem to be the more obvious immediate apps. Likewise, more static um, uh, environment, uh, SS7 for the internet kind of uh, environment, the telcos, uh, mobility carriers, you know, you're building uh, virtual paths across networks that you own and control. Those seem like the more um, uh, obvious immediate apps, all about automating on the fly programmability of networks and not having to rely on online control plane. However, I do believe we haven't seen the killer app here. Somewhere in this room, someone somewhere in this room will come up with some kind of an app that goes viral, something that we do not even know about today. This is the history of innovation, this is the history of Silicon Valley, this is the history of uh, our industry, right? At some point you chug along, chug along solving mundane problems, someone comes up with a brilliant app that got, gets viral and everyone wants it and that in turn will drag the underlying network behind it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think uh, we know yet what that app will be, but I think my sense is that that app will come and its time will come. I think it's a great question because when you look at the spectrum of SDN right now, I see it as two, two different aspects, right? There's the, the virtualization inside the data center and then there's the management of the physical assets on the side. And when you really think about delivering network automation, the price of entry for SDN, what gets you in the door is, is the virtualization portion right in the data center. But if you want to talk about having your eye on the prize, like where's the long term, I think, real win for SDN, it's in that management of the hardware assets for, for exactly the reasons the gentleman said before, right? That some incredibly sophisticated concepts can be handled very easily. And you, and you really start thinking about uh, network segmentation, network separation, right? When you talk about 
uh, user authentication, like that whole piece, right? Building personas and attaching that to a user and fundamentally changing the nature by which the network is constructed. Those are really difficult concepts, right? They're hard to manage. How do you tie an identity? How do you build the right kind of policy around that? And the framework for SDN, I think, is really going to be the enabler for making that happen over the long term. So when you think about that, that second phase of growth and where, you know, where the real win's going to come ultimately, I think that's, that's where it's going to come in the future. OK, uh, I want to uh, go back to one of the comments that saw you made earlier in your presentation. So on one end, when you say that you know, it is all about solution, you have to solve the real problems of the, uh, the customers or enterprises. And on one hand, that is very appealing. That makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, I wonder I, whether when you're talking like that, that you have to provide a complete solution, you have to solve the real problem. Is this some uh, guy from the big company who is trying to make the case that, you know, these little guys will not be able to do something. I'm the only big guy who can give you a complete solution. And as a result, SDN is all about HPs of the world uh, giving you this solution. So again, I don't know what you meant, but if you know, SDN is all about innovation, software, um, third party, small companies coming and being able to give you solution. So I wonder whether you want to reflect on it. Sure. Well, that's absolutely what it's about, though. <laughs> if, you notice, if you notice my fourth bullet, I talked about we have to create an open ecosystem to make this work. And I think that's the challenge, mm -hmm. because we do need to make that work. And I think networking has a good history, at least in the early days of networking, where people were able to innovate because of open interfaces. Uh, but we can't get ahead of ourselves. The concern that we have to have, as I said, we need to make that work. So we need to create good interfaces, figure out how to do certification, figure that out as an industry. If we don't do that, then the danger is that the hype will get ahead of it and people will be disappointed. And so I don't think, you know, if you look at the history of HP, HP actually is, has a great record of you know, working across the industry as opposed to being one player. But I think we have a challenge there as an industry to make sure that we can preserve the innovation while giving, getting enough um, stability in the system so that customers feel comfortable to buy multi-vendor solutions that they can rely on. And this is my concern. Yeah, like I said, mentioned before, if you look at, you know, we want to have Ethernet, not fiber channel, right? Fiber channel, everything works together, but unless it's certified by someone, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so there's only a few vendors. Uh, so we, want to, we need to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a, it's a challenge. But I don't think it's a, you know, oh, oh, we're the big company, we're going to solve all this problem. You know, if I thought we could solve it all on our own, we would, but I, I don't think it's that easy. <laughs> okay. So I guess I'm going to ask only one or two more questions. So if you guys want to uh, get ready to ask the questions, please do. And um, so I want, John, I want to ask you a question. So when you are thinking about funding companies in the SDN space, uh, of course, you have already funded a couple or few. Uh, but now, where do you see new opportunities or opportunities that you would like to tell? I'm sure there are a lot of entrepreneurs in this audience as well. Where should they look? So I mean, we believe that the whole industry will be revolutionized by this. It, you know, much the same way server automation uh, had a makeover because of what VMware kind of catalyzed. So, you know, whether it's monitoring or security or uh, any piece of the networking stack, I, you know, I, we think that there's going to be opportunity there. So the initial investments, you know, whether it's Plexi or Nicira, Embrain, I mean, these are core building blocks, layer four through seven services or. Uh, layer two, three, or you know, all of the above. Um, but I think there's even there's a lot more opportunity. So, you know, I, VCs are uh, they're critics, not writers, Guru. Uh -huh. um, and so we are hopelessly dependent on the creativity of entrepreneurs. Uh -huh. um, but I, I do, you know, we do have a thesis about these various pieces of the of the puzzle that need to be, in my opinion, um, created by startups who don't have the legacy baggage that large companies can have sometimes. Um, and so the pace of innovation with a white canvas is just always greater in startups. Silicon Valley exists because of that. And so you get something this massive, this disruptive, um, it's the entrepreneurs who can create the most value. OK. I mean, though this was meant for John, you guys are welcome to. I would like the record to state that HP is a large company in networking. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a matter of perspective. Yeah. Okay, I, so maybe I should open it up. <laughs> uh, I guess you are ready, so go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, I went to uh, Google yesterday and I searched for the cheapest open flow switch I could buy. And it turns out you can buy an open flow switch for $490. 
So Nine. from this perspective, I think the killer application is not going to come from large guys. It's going to come from small guys around the world who are going to be able to buy this $490 switch. Uh, uh, Guru actually had this great idea, I think, about the App Store. And I think the App Store has to also uh, concentrate on the small guys. So the question that I have is if you folks can brainstorm a little bit more about the App Store, what is the fastest way this App Store could be built and then how would you do it? Would you need a committee, a company, or who would be the driving force behind the App Store? First of all, I guess it was not my idea, it was Shehzad uh, yesterday from Extreme who said that uh, looking ahead, uh, this is what SDN could bring about and there is something, some appeal to that. Uh, and again, App Store, every App Store does not have to have whatever thousands and thousands of apps that app, uh, Apple has, even if there are hundreds of network control and management applications um, that people can uh, use and uh, kind of download and make use of it. That would be a big success for SDN, but I really don't, I haven't thought about it enough to know, but I'm happy to hear um, these experts' opinion on that. I mean, Saar is already saying it's not going to happen, so I don't think you want to ask him that question, but maybe John or Alvin or... Well, let me answer your question. <laughs> so anyway, I didn't say that. I think there's an evolution. It may, there may happen, but we're getting ahead of ourselves, and that's dangerous, because then you'll have disappointment. I don't think we're in a position yet to know if it could happen or not. It might be able to happen at some point. It would probably be a different than what we have today in an app store. I mean, you could have a scenario where if the proper APIs are defined above, right, because if you look at how this works, right, as Alan mentioned, right, you, in the end of the day, have to have some generalized APIs, and people could potentially write applications to those APIs, and you can run them over a generalized system. Um, that could happen, I think, it's going to take some time because you need to have things stabilized so that there's a, there's a reason, uh, there's enough uh, reason why someone could go and write a business around it. They need to have motivation, and for that, they have to have a stable interface. So I think it's a bit early for that. So, John, did it capture your imagination to hear about App Store on top of SDN? Yeah, I mean, we, actually, we talked about that a little bit. You know, if you look at the server sort of comparison, right, there were companies like Blade Logic and Opsware. And then there were companies like RightScale and a series of others that were created so that developers could essentially leverage the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. I think for that to happen, the, the controllers themselves have to have open APIs. Otherwise, you're just going to have proprietary all over again, just at a different tier. Um, and at the same time, networking people are going to have to learn to program applications, not protocols, which may take, may take some time. So I think it's a combination of the both that, that actually will enable it to happen. Okay. The way, the way I would uh, look at the problem, depending if you're an entrepreneur trying to make a lot of money, uh, you got to consider this, how many folks got rich selling open source software to an Amazon? Not too many, right? So the, the important thing is infrastructure, some of those things and solutions that are already touted today are not where the good uh, big money is going to be. But let's say in the App Store, it depends on whether you're trying to build the infrastructure for an App Store or you're trying to take apps uh, uh, that work very well in an effective scale uh, in, in these large uh, new data centers. I think to a large extent, SDN, in one perspective on SDN is it's an ADN, an application-driven network, as in when you need to scale out your app, you know what your app is all about, and programmatically, in a proactive fashion, you're able to cobble together all the resources you need on fly, on the tap. So likewise, if you come at it from app-driven network, building in its security, building in uh, the kind of policies you want to, taking SDN as a given, and then layering um, uh, policies, blueprints, if you will, on top of that app, maybe there's something there. I mean, the other piece of it, uh, again, I can't talk too much about it. We run some fairly large uh, stores, uh, hundreds and thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of VMs, but uh, these scale-out architectures are here to stay, and the ability to cobble together something uh, at line speed uh, in real time, in a matter of seconds, on an as-need basis, there's a lot that can uh, be innovated in, in those areas. OK. Uh, with all the talk of uh, uh, searching for the killer app, it actually reminds me of a quote by uh, Professor David Patterson of Berkeley, who said uh, that the biggest performance improvement is going from a non-working system to a working system. 
Uh, <laughs> and isn't the killer app kind of staring us right in the face? I mean, we've, we've listened for, you know, for a couple of days now about the nightmare that people have in, in maintaining the networks that they, that they already have. Isn't just the, the killer app making those work, making them easier to configure and maintain and getting them to the reactor events you know, benevolently rather than you know, requiring you know, all sorts of massive amount of work to keep them, just keep them alive? Yeah. From, from my perspective, um, I like to think of the killer app could be the integration of OpenFlow and OpenStack and Quantum together, right? Because that's really what's going to drive that initial burst of, of innovation, right? When you start piecing through the websites and looking what's available there, you're like, oh, oh my, there's a lot that's already there and available. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. That, that, that's a big foundation. If people start embracing that first and using that as the core of the driver, that, that can absolutely, I think, be a killer app that's staring us right in the face. Well, but that's, that's like the, the mechanism. It's not the result. You know, the, the result has to be a new, cap you know, a new capability that customers see that you know, lets them do something different or saves them money. You know, that's, that's a means to an end. It's not the end. Yeah. Well, I, I agree. And, and what that end is going to be is going to be different for everyone, right? And I, I was just really trying to suggest that the tool sets, what's going to allow us to get to that end, right? Whether you need it to save money, whether you want to bring a new killer app, whether you want to write on top of that, it's that fundamental tool set that's going to help, that's going to help you get there. I think, I mean, I think what you mentioned is true in terms of that is definitely an app that we can see today as something we can do. I think the thing to think about is that when you go to solve one problem, you may solve it, and you probably will, but you may end up with a different, with a solution that actually is something you didn't even think about. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about killer app. There are things you can do today, such as what you mentioned, programmability, and you don't even have to use SDN for them, but SDN allows you to do it in a generalized fashion that, might, that you might be able to leverage a lot of the capabilities that now exist in other areas in the networking domain. But usually when you go down that path, you end up with some things, you may come up with some solutions or things that are actually more creative than you, the problem you initially tried to solve, and I think that's, we're still, we haven't got to that point yet. Yeah, unfortunately, let's say we had a completely working technical solution today, and you try to bring that into an enterprise, even if it were the killer app, think about what happens today. Most enterprises you go to have a mix of architectures, mix of equipment. The very process of changing from where they are, the very reason you mentioned, right, that's broken, there's a lot of operational day-to-day -day work going on in existing um, network and operations where that's keeping them busy night after night. To consider replacing that system after all the taping and duct tape, it nevertheless works and runs the business to an extent. To replace that and forklift upgrade that is a fairly uh, heavy undertaking. So the way is um, uh, how we can insert these new technologies in a seamless fashion into such enterprises, solve a new rack, uh, solve a problem in a new rack, bring it in. I think if you can do that in a seamless fashion, people will. I mean, as Ernest mentions, many uh, different innovators and uh, leading edge uh, users mentioned they will bring it and want to consider it. But at the same time, you'll hear most folks telling you it's not quite ready for prime time yet. We are a couple of years away because it took years and years and years to operationalize existing networks. It will take years and years and years to operationalize new networks. That is the unfortunate reality in enterprises. The only thing I'd add is if you look at most startups that um, help make these disruptions possible, it, it, operational pain usually isn't enough to get adoption. Mm -hmm. that, that's not sufficient because usually operational pain is thought about from a solution standpoint linearly. People just kind of keep doing a little more or a little bit better what they're doing. You actually need a particular business problem that the existing technology just doesn't solve. And so people shard databases like crazy now. It's not the right way to necessarily do it, but it's a big leap to jump to a, a totally different way about thinking. But some businesses like Facebook or Amazon, they just had to. And so you're seeing mass adoption now of these new databases. I think the same will be true of networking. People will find a business problem they absolutely cannot solve the old way. And then the pain plus that will be so great that you'll see the killer app. Okay, let me ask you at least one last question I have, and then uh, maybe we'll try to wrap it up. So uh, we are talking about all these app stores and uh, new functionality and talking about APIs that will help you do that, right? Where do you think these APIs are going to come from? 
Is that something, I mean, there is a touchy uh, question about should ONF be thinking about that? Or APIs in the software world comes from people building up, uh, good software solutions and then they become default APIs and other people build on top of that? Or so how do you think, where do you think this API will come from? Nicira is a great API. Oh wait, is this on? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if you look at the OSI model, I mean, networking has been successful in the past because you had proper layers, and I think it would be good if we defined layers, whether it's done in the ONF or, or, or somewhere else. I think it would be useful as we start to evolve this to, to come up with the next level of layer and define it. If we don't do it, it's less likely to be standardized. If it's not standardized, you're less likely to have good innovative solutions. So I think but in the software industry, have we... I mean, typically in software industry, there hasn't been standardization organization that standardizes uh, APIs. I mean, that is the argument that you hear. Um, so, an SDN, if it if networking is going software, should we be using processes and recipes that have worked in the software industry or uh, the whatever the networking? Yeah, industry? my my take on it is it's very hard to mandate and standardize APIs. I think the key ultimately is uh, uh, ad hoc solutions where there's a critical mass of users and vendors that come together with something that works, that's open, uh, is ultimately going to win out, I, I do believe. Um, so, so I think the northbound APIs are important to the extent we at least have an ad hoc group of uh, applications that begin to work on a set of APIs and there's enough critical mass of vendors that do it, that's probably as good an approach as possible versus starting with the standards. I think standards uh, uh, may be a, a fallout versus the impetus. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, abs I absolutely agree with that. I, I think that Folk, and we're very standards focused in the network, right? But it has, an, it, it has a, a result of stifling the innovation, right? And I think the customer commitment to, to building the open APIs and sharing those and having a commitment to the open standards is going to help, I think, force vendors, right, to, to tag along and embrace that open standard even more. And when you think about, you know, where we want to go ultimately, having that relationship between customers and vendors or, you know, surrounding the open community, I think is really, is really going to make a difference. Okay, so I think I don't have any more questions. I guess you don't seem to have any more questions. So last, any last word from you guys? No? Okay, so I think we will call the panel close. And I want to thank you again, okay? We should give them a big... Thank you. <laughs>